All right, we can go ahead and get started. So today we're going to cover Laravel and uh, our first dive into an MVC framework. <clears throat> so before we actually get started, we need to install a couple of things. So we already got PHP installed, and I kind of introduced you to Composer last week, but not uh, a whole lot. Uh, so Composer is a package manager, and Laravel actually uses lots of libraries in order to uh, make up the framework. And so it kind of needs to download all of these packages, and it does that through Composer. So Composer is kind of the uh, package manager for PHP. If you've worked in Node, it's kind of like NPM. Um, most technologies have them. And, um, and so we downloaded Composer, and if you kind of looked in your, uh, well, in last week's folder, you had this composer.far file. Uh, the far stands for PHP archive. And I showed you how you could kind of run it by saying PHP and then composer.far. And this will kind of uh, give you access to this composer command line. Now, typing this out every single time gets a little annoying. And, uh, and it's kind of nice, especially when you look around tutorials and stuff, you'll see people just typing in composer, composer install, composer update, just kind of just composer. So how do we get that working on our machine? So what we need to do first is... Um, if you go to your command line and you type in echo path, there's this variable called dollar path. And it, it's a, a series of paths on your computer for whenever you type a command into your terminal, it's going to look for that executable in one of those paths. And so we're going to take that composer.far file and move it into one of those and rename it to just composer. So no more .far, just call it composer and we'll put it in one of these paths so that this way we can just type in uh, composer just like this and it'll work. So I've already done this actually in the past, but um, I'll do it again so uh, hopefully you guys can um, get it, this working on your machine. Okay, so if I kind of go back and type in that dollar path variable, you can see there's a lot of different places, uh, a, diff a bunch of different folders. They're all separated by this colon, so you can see there's one like user local PHP 5 bin colon and then Here's another one. So you can kind of move this wherever you want. And you can kind of figure out, like, so where I actually put my composer, if I type in which uh, composer, it'll kind of say where I placed it. You could place it in something similar uh, as me, or you can place it in another one of these folders. Um, but what I did was I, uh, let's see. OK, so if you want to go C, uh, CD into tilde, so your home directory, and I made a directory called code. OK, so I'll cd into this code directory. And then if you want to move that composer.far file into there, you can do that a number of ways. If I just do open period, so this is kind of where uh, I'm just going to open it like in regular Finder. And then I'm also going to open up another Finder window and go to the stuff that we did last week. So, um, oops. So if you want to just, wherever you put that folder or that file, that composer.far file, if you want to take this and just drag it over here. And I'll just delete my old ones just so it's the same as yours. Yes? Did you create the code folder? Yeah, yeah, I created that folder. Did you do that through terminal? Um, I just, I don't, I mean, I did this a long time ago, so you can just, you can do this through Finder or you can do it through Terminal. Um, if you go to compo getcomposer.org and you can do download and if you run these commands, it'll kind of, uh, eventually give you this file. Should we put composer setup and all that in code as well or just the composer dot? Just the composer dot far. Yeah. And then you can just simply rename it. So I'm rename, renaming it to just Composer. So I'm getting rid of the dot .far.
one of the interesting things just about working with PHP was it really leveled up my command line skills because <laughs> this stuff is um, like, especially how many of you have worked with Node? Oh, no one. Okay. So <laughs> with other technologies, sometimes it's like an install button, boom, you're ready to go. And yeah, this requires a little bit of command line usage. So um, please ask questions because it's definitely one of the, like, probably the harder parts is just installing the stuff. So did you just put code in like, I put it inside my home folder. So I have like my home folder is called Dtang15, and then I created one just called Code. So I moved composer.far into this folder and then renamed that file to just composer. So no file extension. Now, when I went to my terminal and I just typed in that dollar all uppercase path. So there's all these paths and, uh, where terminal will kind of look for an executable that you're trying to execute. So in this case, um, if I'm just typing, uh, uh, well, if I type in composer, it's going to look for composer in one of these folders. And you notice I already put my path, uh, like that code folder in there. And so there it kind of knows where to look for to, to find that. So we need to add this to yours because you probably haven't done this yet. So in order to get this working, we need to open up that bash profile file. <laughs> so uh, last week, or I think it was week one we did this, but um, if we, so I'm going to open up another tab. The bash profile file was inside the home folder as well. So if I cd into tilde, which is home, and I do ls-a, so list out all the files, including hidden files in this directory. We created this bash profile. And so we did this, remember, with uh, when we installed PHP. So we're going to edit this file and add in that code directory in there so that whenever we type in some type of um, thing we want to execute, it will look inside that code folder. Any questions? OK, so I'm going to open up this file. And the way I can do that is um, oh, let's see, hold on. I always forget this command, so, oh, that's okay. So from the command line, you can type in um, open dash A, and then the name of uh, your program. In this case, I'm using Atom. So I want to open this uh, bash profile file with the Atom application. And that's what A stands for, application. If you're familiar with, like, um, Vim or Emacs or nano, all those, you can actually edit this file using those. But if you're not, this is probably the most um, user-friendly way to do it. OK, so in mine, I already put this uh, kind of a little while ago. But um, if you copy this file, so I'll paste this in uh, Slack. So I'll put it under um, class demos. So add that file to bash profile, save it. Or sorry, add this line to bash profile, save it, and then restart terminal. So you can see that that other thing with the PHP line, it's the same as uh, 
the same thing. We're kind of adding that PHP executable that we downloaded uh, the first day, putting it inside, putting that path inside of um, that path variable. So we're kind of adding it to this. We're doing the same thing with um, uh, Composer. Yes. Uh, let's see. Here's it. I'll paste this in the Slack too. You could replace Adam with like Sublime Text or whatever if you're using another one. Okay, so at this point, whenever you change bash profile, you want to uh, just restart terminal. So I'm just going to restart it. And then hopefully, if you just type in composer, you're going to see a list of options here. And then everything's installed correctly. What was that? Yeah, yeah, just Composer. So how many people got it working? Yay, <laughs> nice. So if you type in which Composer, it'll tell you where it's located. And you can see it's in that code directory. You can do this with any command too. So if I say which PHP, you can see that it's pointing to that new one we installed week one. And if it's not working and you just type in $.path and you don't see this code folder in the path, then you um, maybe you didn't save the bash profile or you didn't restart terminal, but uh, you know that'd probably be the reason why. So this was just uh, an area where I put the composer file, but you could also put it in some of these other locations, like uh, user local PHP five bin. Maybe that would make sense too. I think I did it in here just because it was like easy to delete. So if I want to just delete all these things, I can. It's like in one spot that I see regularly. That, but um, it's kind of up to you where you want to put it. Everyone does it a little bit differently. Cool. Any questions? So this is like the general process for um, instant. Uh, if you've ever messed with any like command line utilities, whether it's uh, just other things, and you end up getting something a terminal saying command not found, it's probably because of this. Because the command you're entering, it's not in the path in that dollar path variable. So you, you would need to modify your bash profile to do this. So just as an FYI, if you ever mess around with like other technologies. I know that was probably one of the most frustrating things when, you know, I first got started, and uh, you know, I, I I remember trying like Mongo and Redis and all these things, and it's like ah, oh, Redis command not found, and it's it was you know because I didn't understand this well enough. Okay, so I'm gonna close some of this. Okay, so that's Composer. So now we need to install Laravel. So if we uh, go to laravel.com and you can go to the documentation, there's a few ways we can actually install the framework. So when I say install the framework, it's going to download all of the files from Laravel and then get all of the packages that Laravel depends on and pull those in. And then this way we can run it on our machine. So if you go to laravel.com, go to the documentation, and if you scroll down a little bit, there's a couple ways we can actually install or create a new Laravel app. Um, we can use Composer to install a global Laravel command. 
So I could say something like Laravel, Laravel new blog, and this would create an application called blog. So this is one way we could do it. Uh, another way we can do it is just run this really long composer command, and this will kind of create um, a Laravel project on our machine. This one's actually a lot harder for me to remember, so I usually go with the previous one because I only have to install this Laravel installer once, and then I can just use Laravel new, and it's a lot easier to remember. Um, Ruby also has like a command kind of like this too, so it's very familiar. Like I think it's uh, Rails new or something. Uh, Ember does it too as well. So. Okay, so let's kind of go with this approach. So we're going to use Composer, download the Laravel installer, and then create this new Laravel application. So I'll go to my command line, and I'm just going to paste this in. So once you do that, you should be able to type in the Laravel command and it will give you some options and say like what version of that Laravel command was installed. So again, I'm just running this composer command and this will allow me to type in this Laravel new command. Any questions? Okay. <laughs> Yes. The, the bash profile, since I, I wasn't here on the first week, I didn't install it because I'm using that. Oh, okay. Um, uh, let's figure it out in lab after class. <laughs> yeah. Can you speak up in like a specific no, because um, this is actually a global command, so it doesn't matter where. It, it'll just install it like in this global registry. So, so when uh, when you run this command, you'll want to be in a specific folder. But this one, no. What was that? Uh, this thing or Laravel? Uh, no, no, no. Um, I don't know what it's doing under the hood, but it doesn't require us having to modify anything. So, oh, whoops. So show of hands, how many of you got this Laravel command installed? If you typed in this, it showed you like these set of options, or something like this. <laughs> Just Laravel. Um, oh, oh wait, maybe I missed something. Ah, yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're right, okay, sorry, I, I forgot this because I did this a long time ago. Um, you do have to add something else to the path. Yeah, so hope, hopefully you kept your bash profile open, otherwise go back to it. Okay, that's what this was. Yeah, I <laughs> sorry. So add this right under the code line. I'll paste this in the Slack too. Yeah, so I paste it in Slack. Um, add this to restart terminal. Then it should hopefully be there.
Did that help for anyone else? Yeah? Cool. So your batch profile will probably be three lines long, and it contains three, uh, these three lines. Okay, so now at this point, you should be able to run Laravel new and then the app name. So now you, the, uh, when you run this command, this actually, you probably want to be in a certain directory. You probably want to be like, I'm guessing all of you have like a ICP 405 folder and where you put all your stuff. Um, I'm going to move to my folder of that and then run that command. Uh, All right, so I'm going into my Okay, so I'm in my like ITP 405 folder where I put all my stuff. So now I'm going to run Laravel new and we're not going to run this command very often, so we're going to probably build off the same installation so we don't have to install it every single time. But uh, we're going to call this um, ITP-tunes. So Laravel new space ITP dash tunes. And by running that, it's going to install all these packages using Composer behind the scenes. Uh, no, I, I only called it ITP dash tunes. Um, the database is a music database. I just figured it's like iTunes, but whatever. <laughs> yes, Laravel new ITPTH tunes. Oh, after you install it? Um, and I just delete the uh, directory and just rename it. <laughs> or just rerun the command. Just so that there's no errors going forward. Okay, so if I do ls, you can see here's that directory. So I'll cd into the ITP tunes directory. And this is the folder you'll want to open up with Atom. So we could say uh, open dash a Atom and then period, meaning like the current directory. And this will open it up um, an instance of Atom in this directory. Or you could just like click through it through the finder window and like drag it and yeah. <laughs> So with any framework, it's, it comes with a lot of files, a lot of folders, and I'm going to warn you, like that's probably the most intimidating thing because as we start adding code, we're going to be touching at least like five files. And so if I hop around or whatever, you know, um, please ask questions because I think that's probably one of the most challenging parts is just it feels like there's so many files. Whereas, you know, when we did uh, the demo last week, we just did everything in one single file. But as with frameworks, they kind of break everything out, separation of concerns. Uh, organize things a little bit better. Um, so that's just all frameworks in general.
Okay, so how do we run this project? So I'm gonna, um, so we, uh, the way we can run this is we can say PHP, and then inside our project, there's this command called artisans or this file. So we can run kind of like when we did PHP space composer.far, it's kind of like the same thing where I say PHP space artisan, and I can run, uh, and I can say serve. So PHP artisan serve, this kind of runs any Laravel project once you're inside that directory. And we can navigate to localhost colon 8000. Yes? Um, probably. I'd have to look in the docs. Yeah, just look on the docs of the installation. I'm pretty sure it's probably like dash p or dash dash port or something. You could just try those too. So if I navigate to localhost colon 8000, you should see kind of the welcome screen for Laravel. Show of hands, did everyone get here? Cool. If you got stuck along the way, that's OK. We can figure it out in lab and uh, just, you know, just kind of watch. Okay, so for the little app that we're going to make, we're, we're basically going to rebuild what we did last week. So you already have an idea of what we're building, just using Laravel. And we're going to use that same exact SQLite database. So if you want to go to um, either re-download it or grab it from your previous folder, either one would work. Maybe I'll just grab it from my previous folder. So if I go to my... Uh, last week stuff. I'm going to grab that SQLite database. I'm going to duplicate this file. And I'm going to call this database.sqlite. So I'm just renaming it. So instead of chinook.db, it'll be database.sqlite. Then I'm going to take this and just move it over into our database folder. So it's inside, sitting right there. And the reason I put this here is uh, by default, so Laravel supports multiple database types. You can use uh, MySQL or SQLite. Uh, by default, if you are going to use SQLite, you can just place it inside here, and then we don't have to do like any configuration of telling where the database is. It'll just kind of lo automatically look there, so it just makes things easy. So again, just copy that chinook.db. Rename it to database.sqlite, move it into the database folder, and you're good to go. So the next thing that we want to do is open up the .env file. And this is a file that uh, contains what's called environment variables. So I can say, I, I can do a lot of configurations here. I can say, um, if I have API keys or database username and password or which database I'm using, I can just, it's like, it, it's like a, a sensitive configuration file. So by default, Laravel uses MySQL. We're going to change this to use SQLite. 
So instead of my SQL here, we're going to change this to SQLite. And we can just delete all of these other DB uh, variables. And this should be the last configuration thing that we have to do today. <laughs> Yes. Uh, oh, there's now EMV. Um, you can just copy this, rename it, uh, uh, rename the copy to .emv, and just um, yeah. Any questions? OK, so if we change that .env file, we do need to restart that PHP server. So if you go to your, back to your command line, do uh, control C to stop it, and then just press up and just rerun it. So again, just restart PHP artisan serve. And if I go back, refresh, hopefully you see the Laravel homepage still. All right, so I'm going to open up another window just so I have my server running in one. And then the other one, I'm just going to be typing some commands in. Okay, so let's kind of do a quick tour of like all the folders here. So when I browse to localhost colon 8000, what's actually like getting run? So one of the biggest uh, differences between frameworks and raw PHP files is like what, uh, when we did last week, we would navigate to localhost slash index.php or tracks.php, right? Basically, I was navigating to the exact PHP file and that was the thing being run. Inside frameworks, it, it doesn't correspond that, uh, the same way. Uh, we're not running specific files. Instead, we have URLs like slash tracks or slash genres. And behind the scenes, it ends up loading some HTML, but it doesn't even have like .php in the URL or anything. So uh, so one, it kind of like hides the technology being used. And two, it's um, I know my directory structure doesn't correspond to my URL structure. So what's getting run here? So if I navigate to localhost 8000, the thing that's getting run is if you open up the routes directory, there's this web.php. And this is the place where you can define all the URLs in your application. So right here, we're saying uh, when you navigate to the index of the site, we're going to load up a template or what's called a view named welcome. And this view is located inside the storage direct or uh, sorry, inside the resources directory. And then th there's a folder called views. And then there's a file called welcome.blade.php. And then so if you kind of look at this welcome page, it's it's all the HTML used to generate this page. So this is kind of how it corresponds. We could change this URL to anything we want. I could say about, and if I navigate to slash about, I can see that Laravel homepage as well. And this is, you could really come up with your own URLs here. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to um, be anything specific. OK, so it's loading up a view called welcome. And this file is called welcome.blade.php. 
So Laravel comes with a templating engine called Blade. It's um, they kind of have some nice helpers and stuff in there. So I kind of showed you some last week when we did like that shorthand syntax with, um, remember kind of like when it was like for each and for each, like all that, those blocks uh, to make writing HTML inside PHP a little bit easier. They have stuff like that, but even easier. And uh, they also have things like, um, like escaping things so that it's not vulnerable to like um, uh, attackers. So we'll look at uh, Blade a little bit more. You can kind of see some of it. You can see like there's these if statements and these, you know, this is all like Blade templating language. It's nothing uh, too like crazy. It's just kind of some helpers for writing PHP inside uh, HTML. So we'll go look at that a little bit later. But let's kind of get started and just kind of rebuild what we did last week. So last week we did a search page against genres. So let me actually load this up. So it was week two. This is the one I pushed up to Heroku. So we were loading up invoices. We showed um, like the, um, the first and last name of the customer, their email. We also did some searching so I could uh, do a search against you know one of these names. Actually, it may have been email. I don't remember actually, but yeah, I think it was email. All right, so if I click on one of these, search for it, it kind of filters by email. Um, I can clear it. If I type in some garbage, it said no uh, invoice is found. So we'll just kind of rebuild something like this. Okay, so if you want, you can get, actually get rid of this comment. I'm going to delete it just to preserve space. So this is going to be our home page. So I'm going to do the same thing where it's just locate, uh, visit slash, and then we're going to load up a view called invoices. So this route slash We'll load up a view called invoices, and I'm going to go inside the resources views folder and create this file called invoices.blade.php. Now I'm going to copy out the HTML from last week and then I'll paste it back in the chat so that actually I think I put it, it's in the chat. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to copy out just like the HTML section from the doc type from the from last week so we don't just don't have to retype this. So inside the invoices blade PHP file, I'm just going to paste this in and I'm going to delete out the PHP echo statements. So all the for each and for each, I'm going to delete all this. Maybe I'll rename this to like invoices on the title. So it's just plain static HTML. So I'll copy this, paste it inside the class demos. Okay, so if I refresh, it's just kind of like an empty table. Yes. All the the PHP from last week and just just the HTML pieces I wanted. Yeah, yeah.
So as it stands now, we have this route function and when a request comes in for the path slash or the index, all we do is load up this HTML page. Now we could put all of the logic that we need right inside here for you know talking to the database, getting the data, and then putting it inside the view. That would work. It just, uh, as an application grows, you would have a lot of these route functions in one single file and it gets you know a little bit harder to maintain. So generally the practice is uh, to use what's called a controller. So we're gonna have a, uh, so the way this kind of looks is the route will instantiate this controller thing and the controller will be the one that talks to the database, collects the data, and it will eventually load up the view. So it's kind of like this workflow. So I'm gonna change this to do exactly that. So what this would look like would be when a request comes in for slash, I want to load up a controller called invoices controller. You can name this whatever you want, but given that this thing page is about invoices, I'm going to uh, create a controller called invoices. If I was creating a page maybe around genres, I'd probably have a genres controller. If I had one on tracks, a tracks controller. It's kind of up to you how you want to name it, but um, maybe something that ties it to the like what's going on on the page. So I'm going to uh, instantiate this, or Laravel will instantiate this invoices controller class and then call a function that you specify. So it kind of follows this syntax where you say the class name, at, and then the method name. So I call mine index. Uh, it's more of a convention. So typically, like, the index method will return, like, a list of things, whether it's a list of genres or a list of invoices. This page is showing a list of invoices, so it seems appropriate. But you can call this, again, whatever you want. It doesn't have to be called index. So now I need to create this controller. So if we go to our command line, we can run the command php artisan make colon controller and then the name of the controller. So I'm going to call this invoices controller. And I'll paste this in the chat too in case you, know, you forget. We're going to be using this PHP artisan command a lot. There's a lot of utilities in here. so. It has things to generate files like controllers, models, which we'll look at later. So a lot of good stuff in there. So where did it put this file? So invoices controller got created inside the app, HTTP controllers, and then invoices controller. Yes. Yes, yes. Anything after PHP Artisan is comes with Laravel. So all these like other commands and stuff are all things that you can probably Yeah, totally. So all that really did was create this file. You could type this out yourself, but I know from um, you know, even writing a few Laravel apps, it just remembering all this, it's easy to forget like maybe the namespace or the use statement or something, right? So it just kind of generates this file so you don't have to like remember it. Okay, so like I mentioned, when a request comes in for slash, it's going to invoke a method called index on this invoices controller. So what I want to do here is I want to create that method. So I'm going to say public function index And this function is going to return that view. So return that view invoices. So I'm going to copy that and just paste it right here. And you can go back to your web PHP file and just delete that get um, the first thing. So 
So we have a route. So this thing's a route. It talks to a controller. And then the controller is just a function, or it calls a function on the controller that loads up a view, which is just another word for like a, a PHP template. And then this invoices template corresponds to the invoices.blade.php file. Why don't they have a building type for the PHP type at the top? Um, oh, that's not required. Yeah, in PHP, you can actually just have the top. And um, if it's only PHP afterwards, then you don't need the closing tag. Yes? Uh, yeah, uh, like route. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the difference? Yeah, yeah. Um, if you're just doing something where you have like a URL that loads up a view, that approach works great. But as you start adding more logic to the page, you could do it inside that one single function, but it gets longer and longer. And especially as you add more and more pages, you'll eventually want to make this file smaller. And controllers are like a way to do that. You can just have isolate like uh, modular chunks for like all the invoice uh, stuff goes in the invoices controller. And so it's um, separated out, especially because like, you know, imagine like a new person also joins your team on and they're working and you have a Laravel project. It's really nice being able to go to this one single file and say, Oh, here's all my URLs for my page. But once it's mixed in with a lot of like extra logic, it gets harder to see that. So yeah, for simple thing is cool. And I'm pretty sure that's, you know, that's why it comes installed that way. But, um, and also just so I can teach controllers, because that's kind of like <laughs> the, the C inside MVC framework. So yeah, oh, um, so Laravel is, you know, an MVC framework. So, uh, right, you got MVC. So it was like Ruby on Rails and, you know, a lot of technologies have this. So V is the V, C is the controller. M stands for model, and we're not going to look at that quite today, but uh, we've looked at two thirds of it. <laughs> so request comes in, it hits the controller, the controller loads up a view, and you see a web page. Yes? It, yeah, so it's related in this web PHP file. We, the route is like the URL path, and uh, the control, and when the request comes in for whatever that URL is, it executes that function on the controller that you specify. So it's just like another mapping. It's like delegating to this other function. So when this URL gets hit, call this function. OK, so. Imagine if um, in here we did some database query, we collected some data, and I wanted to uh, do something with it. So I'm just going to hard code something for now. I'll just say uh, hello equals world. So imagine this was like some database results or something. How would we get this into this invoices.blade.php file? So we can pass in information into this view function through an array. And we can say, uh, we can give it some name. I could say something like world is equal to this hello variable. So whatever is in this hello variable will be accessible in the template under this world variable. So I'm just kind of renaming it. Let's actually make this a little bit. This Hello World sucks. Um, let's call this um, semester spring 2019. Call this uh, course ITP 405. All right, so we can pass this information. I'll, I'll say semester is semester. And course, oh sorry, course, arrow, course. Now these key, like the variable name is course, and then the key is course, but they don't have to be the same thing. If I wanted to, I could call this, uh, let's see, USC semester. 
and then inside my template, I could access USC semester. So it, it doesn't have to map like one to one the way I did with course. It just really depends on how you want to um, like label it. But let's stick with USC semester just so you can see that, hey, these don't have to be the same thing. So I'm passing in these two variables into this template. And this could be like database driven stuff. It, it could come from anywhere. So if I go to my invoices blade PHP file, I'll just put this maybe at the top of the page in the body. And the way we can spit this out, kind of like a PHP echo statement, we can use the double curlies. So we can say curly curly, and I can say USC semester curly curly uh, course. So those two variables, which were the keys here, are accessible in the template by saying curly curly. So a little shorter than PHP echo. And um, there's like some security benefits to this. You'll see these double curlies a lot just in a lot of frameworks for like placeholders for dynamic data, both in like JavaScript and backend stuff. So it's just, it's a pretty common convention. So if I refresh, Okay, let's see. Oh, wait. Sorry, forgot the dollar signs. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, so let's make this more dynamic. So instead of passing in these this hard coded information, I'm just going to delete this now. We'll go back. Now let's use uh, let's write an actual SQL query to pull in this information and put it onto the page. Um, okay, so in Laravel, there's like uh, there's something called the query builder and it's a class called DB. So instead of writing just raw SQL, like we are using like that PDL class that we learned, there's actually another abstraction on top of that that Laravel provides and it's called the DB class. So, um, so the way this works is we say DB colon colon and we can call a function called table. And I want to hit the invoices table. So in order to get all the results, I can say arrow get, and this will return all the invoices. So I'll say invoices is equal to this expression. This will basically do like um, select all from invoices. Now, if I want to pass this information to the view, I'll say invoices, fat arrow, uh, and then the invoices variable. <coughs> yes? This, the equal sign arrow is only used to pass in uh, things, variables to the view, right? Yes. Like the, okay. Yeah, so any other variable inside this function won't be accessible in this view. Okay. Yeah, so this is a select star from invoices, pulling all the invoices. We're passing it to the view. And then in our template, here's this white space for where we had like the for each. Now we can we can use kind of a blades equivalent of that for each statement, and we can say at for each invoices. as invoice and at the bottom I will say at n for each this is a little more terse and in this first TD I'll say dollar invoice arrow and then each column is a property 
So in this case, there was invoice date. And uh, I think the second one was like the, oh yeah, date and then total. So invoice total. Now we don't have the customer and the email information yet because we haven't joined those tables. So we'll get to that in a minute. But we do have these two pieces. So if I go back and refresh, we're going to get an error. And it says class app HTTP controllers DB not found. And um, every class in Laravel comes with uh, what's called a namespace. And it's like a way of organizing it so that there's no name clashes between class, no name clashes between classes. So you can imagine like if you have a, a PHP app and you have one library and they created uh, a class maybe called config and then somebody else creates one called config. There's a clash there, right? Because they're named the same thing. So how do we differentiate between the two? Uh, we use something called namespaces. And so the controllers in a namespace called app HTTP controllers. Uh, this is not, it doesn't have to correspond to a directory structure called this, but it can. And there are like some conventions around that. Um, but just know that like namespace is a way of like, ex um, it's kind of like your name, right? I mean, we all have, we all, we, there's a lot of similar first names, but then we have a last name to differentiate it even further. And then sometimes like a middle name too. It's kind of like the same thing where you just add on like a middle and a last name. Um, to differentiate it. So I'm trying to use DB, but it's saying class app HTTP controller DB is not found. And that's because this DB class is actually not inside this namespace. It's not a controller, it's kind of like a, a generic global library. So how do we tell it, don't look for it in here, look for it in the, what's called like the root namespace or the global namespace. We can go to the top and we can just say use DB. DB is global. It doesn't, I think the, the namespace is, um, it's like in that global namespace. So there is no namespace essentially. So you can say uh, use DB and then we can just use it freely in here. So if now I refresh, that namespace error will go away. So you can do this same kind of query with every single other t other table. Just swap out the name of the table right here. Calling get will execute the query and give you the results. Okay, so let's do a join so that we can pull in the customer information. So going back to here, we said there's the customer name and email, so let's pull that as well. So I typically kind of break each uh, one of these method invocations onto separate lines. So I'll put the get on the next line. And there's a function named join. So I want to join against the customers table. And let me actually open up the uh, the schema so you can click on it from week two. So there's this customer ID. So this is the foreign key in the invoices table. And then the customer ID is the primary key inside the customers table. So it's kind of like the inner join statement. And I can say uh, where or invoices.customerID is equal to customers dot customer ID so now that I joined against this if I refresh the page hopefully there's no errors Let's add in this information into the template. So we can go here, and I can do curly curly invoice 
arrow, and the name of the customer was first name and last name. So I'll say first name space invoice arrow last name. And if I go back and refresh, okay, so we got the, the first and last name showing. Let's do the email too. So the email is invoice arrow email. So refresh, and we're pulling the information. Yes. Sure. So hopefully you can see that there's like already less code. We didn't have to like establish a PDO connection. We didn't have to write out kind of like the raw SQL statement and do the bind param stuff. Like this class uh, does this for us behind the scenes. And we have like a nice separation of concerns where the URL is defined in one spot, which then points to a function in a controller that gets called, which contains like the logic of our app. And then it just says here, let's pass in the necessary information that, um, that the template needs or the view. And then the view can just render it simply with uh, this like shorthand blade syntax. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, sure. Which one of invoices controller? <laughs> Query exception. Um, any other details? Oh, okay. Uh, inside that .env file, did you delete all the things except for DB connection? And then did you restart layer? Uh, okay, yeah. Anytime you change this, restart PHP artist and serve. Yes. Uh, yeah, so this is pretty much you guys skip like making the connection to the other stuff. Yep. Which is great. But uh, it also means that you have something in there that's not necessarily the object. So oh, the, uh, the fetch object? Uh, object has the, 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 the array, so. Yeah, yeah, here, let me pull it up. Um, This thing, right? Yeah, the right fetch object. Yeah, yes. So yeah, this DB class is doing this uh, that for us behind the scenes. Okay. Yeah. So in general, I think like not just Laravel, but frameworks in general, do a lot of them sort of do that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why uh, like Rails does it. Um, they all kind of have some type of database abstraction um, that hides away some of those details, like using PDO, like even just looking at this, I don't even know PDO is involved unless you actually like do a little bit of research, but. Oh, rows into objects. Yes, that's a very common pattern. Yeah, every row becomes like an object and then the columns become properties on that object. Okay, so 
let's go to the invoices template again and let's make this search thing work. So I'm gonna go to the form and instead of the action being index PHP, it's gonna be slash. So it's just gonna resubmit it to itself, but there is no index PHP, it's just slash, which is like the root. So I changed that in the template. And if I go back to my page and do a search, you can see it does get kind of thrown into the query string param. So I could, uh, let's see, I'll type in, um, let's see what I do. Okay, so I did a search by somebody's first name. It gets thrown into the query string. It's not actually filtering down by it, but uh, we'll make that work. So I did email kind of last week, but we'll make we'll just do it, make it a little more complicated and search by either the first name or the last name, just so I can show some other features of it. Okay, so when we resubmit this page. This URL will get triggered again, which means this uh, controller action will get hit, or controller method. Um, and then we'll be able to access the query param directly in this method, and then do something about it. So what I want to do here is I want to say, I'm going to rename this to query. And then I'm going to say uh, kind of a little bit below it, invoices is equal to query arrow get. And I need to add a semicolon at the end of that other statement. So I just essentially just broke this up into like two lines. Because I'm going to add like a little bit of logic right here. So kind of the logic that I want to add is if there's a query string parameter called uh, search, I'm going to add like a where clause to this query to say where the first name contains whatever was searched for. So how do I get access to this? In plain PHP, we had access to this, right? Dollar underscore get. Um, in Laravel, all that stuff still works. It's just not really recommended to use. Um, in Laravel, we can capture it using a variable called request that gets passed into index. And you can type hint it and say um, what the type is, and that's why this uh, this use statement has been in added to this controller. So it's saying there's a request variable that gets called autom 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 um, automatically passed into this index method, and it's of this class type, so this request. And then here we can say if request arrow query search. So if that search query string param exists, this will evaluate to true and we can do something. We can add, um, add it to like the where clause or uh, if it's false, I think it's um, or if it's not there, it'll be null. So inside this if statement, we can append to this query statement and we'll say the query is equal to, or sorry, we can say query arrow, and there's another function called where. So I can say where the first name is equal to request query search. Or like condi uh, conditionally building onto this query. And then the final statement is actually executing it. Yes. No, we'll have to do that here too. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Well, let's see. In this example, I think the form will automatically take care of it when it gets thrown into the URL. So yes, in a way. Um, in the homework, you actually had to do it manually, um, which we can cover at the end if nobody saw the message in Slack. <laughs> OK, so if I refresh this, I still have the search query string parameter. So we can see that the results do get filtered. OK, so that's cool. Uh, now, by looking at this, the search inbox, uh, inbox um, or input box got wiped away. Let's make sure that the search term ends up here as well. So we can go, or actually, I got a question for you. Uh, how do you think we should do that? How can we get kind of like whatever was typed into the box to appear here? Yeah. Could you pass it into the view? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so in the view, we have access to the information. We could just pass it directly back into the view. So we could call this search and then pass in request query search. So now we can go to the template. And for this uh, input, we can say value is equal to, and we'll say search. So this will either be null. If it's null, nothing will show up. But if there's a value, it will show up. So we're just kind of passing it right back to the view and then rendering it inside the value attribute. So if I go back and refresh, you can see it's still there. Or it becomes there. <laughs> Sure. Thanks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> OK, so if I go to this search and then just type in some garbage and hit search, nothing shows up. So you know, how can we make it to uh, saying something like, you know, no invoices were found? So last week, the way we did this was we did a count on the number of invoices. And if it was 0, then we rendered this TD cell. So I'm going to copy this HTML. And I'll paste this too. Now, we could follow the same type of uh, logic, but Laravel's blade templating engine has something really nice. So instead of using for each, we can use for else. And so we'll say n for else. And we can give it a second. Um, we can say at empty and then paste it right in here. So if there's stuff, it'll keep doing this like for each over invoices. And then if there's nothing, it'll say add empty or render this one. So you know, just a little bit less logic just through like a very nice uh, declarative templating language. Makes it very obvious to see like what's going on. So if I go back, refresh, you can see that. <clears throat> uh, 
Okay, so for the sake of completeness, I'm going to add an anchor tag here that just links to slash. So I, if I just say clear, um, I'll say class is equal to btn, I think btn link and bootstrap, just to make it look decent. Okay, so now if I type in something and I want to do clear, it'll just kind of redirect back to the page without any search query string param. So actually, it would probably make more sense moving this next to the button. Okay, good enough. Okay, so there's like two more things. So if I wanted, to, right now I'm only searching by the first name. So if I type in like Luis, um, paste it, cool, it works. But if I typed in the last name, nothing comes back. It's going to be empty. Let's make it so that we can search for the first name or the last name. So if I go to the search con uh, the controller, I can append to this query, and I can say uh, query arrow, and I can say or where. So that's kind of like saying, you know, if the first name is equal to this or the last name is equal to this, then include that in the results. So I'll say or where last name is equal to this request search. So there's a lot of uh, like other methods on this um, like DB class. They call it the query builder. So I can do very like conditional um, where clauses, all kinds of stuff. So where the first name is equal to something or the last name is equal to that search value. So if I refresh, you can see now it's included back because we're searching also on the last name. Any questions? So right now, every t if we were to add more routes to this app, you know, we'd have slash and slash tracks and slash genres, we, you know, multiple pages. And we'd have to copy the HTML skeleton into every single template, which one, it's kind of annoying. Two, it would uh, lead to inconsistencies in our app. So imagine if I want to add like a new style sheet to one of the page or to my entire app, I'd have to go through every single template and add it, which uh, just becomes like a maintenance nightmare. So wouldn't it be nice if we could just have like one generic HTML skeleton, and then just the specific stuff to invoices in this specific template? Uh, we kind of achieved that through maybe in like ITP 300 or 303. You learned about like includes, so you would create includes for headers and footers and navigation, like all the common pieces, and then just put those into each one of your templates. We can achieve. Uh, a similar idea through Blade. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Resources Views folder, and I'm going to create this file called layout.blade.php. It doesn't have to be called Layout. It just happens to be, um, I don't even know if it's a common convention. I think it is, but uh, it's just intuitive. <laughs> so this is going to be like our master layout, and then we'll just have uh, invoices be invoice specific stuff. Okay, so if we look at this template, I'm going to cut out everything from the body and up. So I'll say cut, paste this into layout, and then I'll cut everything after uh, the body, so the closing body and the closing HTML tag. I'm going to paste that in here. So this is all like static stuff. And so everything in between is like all the dynamic portions that are specific to invoices. So 
So what we can do now is inside here, we can use these section tags or like these section helpers in Blade. And we can say, we're going to create a section called main. So it's going to have a like an opening tag. And at the bottom, it's going to say end section. So this little block here represents like a main section. So section, main, end section. Then I can go to my layout file and I want to say I want the anything called section to be rendered right here. And I can do that by saying at yield main. So this main key, this is you can call this whatever you want. I just happen to call it main because it's like the main section of the, the page. And we'll yield out that main section right here. Now the last piece is right now if we were to load up, um, if we hit slash and then it hits the index controller or the index method on the invoices controller, it loads up invoices view and right here there's no knowledge of this being tied to that layout file. You know, I could have called this layout file anything I wanted. I could call it like master page or main layout or whatever, but this view has no knowledge of this. So in order to give it knowledge of this template at the top we can say at extends layout and this key right here corresponds to the file name before the dot blade dot php so if i called it like main dot blade dot php this could be also called extends main so now this template knows about this and it will render this layout and put this main section inside this yield main part so this way we can kind of reuse like that header and footer uh, part of the HTML skeleton. So now we got invoice specific template logic in this view and there's nothing else. So if I refresh this and if I just view the source, you can see it's still there. It's not gone. It, um, and if I wanted to, you know, add a new CSS file, a new JavaScript file to my uh, my app, all I have to do is just add it in one spot, and I'm good to go. So this is a pretty common uh, practice that you probably also see in other frameworks as well. Just having like a master page or a, a main layout page. Now, one other thing is. If we look at this layout, I gave it a title of invoices. If I created like other pages, I wouldn't want that title to be invoices because I would um, ideally I'd want to you know reuse this on multiple pages. So how can I make this dynamic? I can go back here, and I'm just going to create another section. So I'm going to call this title, and in this case, um, it doesn't need like a closing tag. I can just pass it a second argument. And so I just created like an arbitrary value called title and I can use it right here. So I can say at yield title. So now this invoices view just has everything it really needs for just specific to invoices. And then it does have some control over things like um, you know, the title, if you want to use like extra placeholders for uh, the title or like meta uh, description tags for like SEO, you know, I do, most pages have a very unique um, like meta set of meta tags so that for SEO, if you go to like Amazon, you look at um, cat food or something, right? It's like the, the, the meta tags are uh, cat food. It's not like some generic Amazon thing. It's, you know, so it's good for SEO. So you can do stuff like that too, where you can have like meta tags here, but targeting the content that's specific to like that view. Okay, so the last piece is now just uploading this to Heroku. 
So I'm going to close these other tabs. So we got the app working. If you want to go to Heroku, and uh, let's see. All right, I have too many things. All right, so I need to delete one of mine. Okay, so I'm going to create a new app. I'll call this, uh, let's see, uh, Detang ITP tunes 2019. So maybe, I mean, you could do yours, whatever you want, but. I'll say create app. Now, like we like what happened with last week, um, Heroku doesn't support SQLite out of the box, so we need to do that same configuration again to get this to work. So close all these files. And if you open up that composer.json file, and I put a link to it kind of in week three, so deploying Laravel to Heroku. And it's the same thing where it says, add this to the require block in Composer JSON. So in that require block in Composer JSON, I'm going to tack this on here. So this will kind of tell Heroku we're using SQLite for this app. Uh, the second thing is run Composer update. So I'll go to my command line. And I can stop the server. I'll say composer update. So anytime you kind of add a new pack, so I've essentially added a new package to this project, and every time you modify that composer JSON, you just want to run composer update. Okay, and then all these other steps you kind of probably already did. Oh, okay. Yeah, because we already did, um, well, in the instructions, I had it set up so that if you want to do it where it's like you push up to GitHub and it automatically pushes to Heroku, you can do that as well. Do we do that? Or maybe that's kind of nice. OK. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and do this. Um, I'm going to create a GitHub repo. Okay. So I'll say new. I'm going to call it the exact same thing. It doesn't have to be, but I think, or no, you know what? Let's see, where is it? We'll call this ITP tunes class. So I'm going to create this repository on GitHub. Okay, so let me go to the project, and I'm going to run git status. Oh, I haven't created a git repository out of this, so we need to say git init. And then we can say git status. So I'll make a commit. I'll say git add dash dash all. If I do git status. We've all kind of added this to the staging area. I'll say git commit uh, finished first um, page in, or let's see, finished the invoices page. OK, so now I'm going to push it up to GitHub. So I'll copy out these two lines. OK, so I'll refresh the GitHub repository. So now we have the code on GitHub. 
So what we can do now is on the Heroku side, you can say connect to GitHub. There's this button right here. And you can choose the repo. Okay, so now I need to search for it here. Okay, so mine's a little bit different just because um, yours will probably show up, but I put all the ITP uh, stuff inside a GitHub organization and it's not showing up here. So I just clicked on the link, but you probably won't end up doing this. Um, Okay, yeah, so I just need to grant access. Oh, shoot. Uh. All right, one sec. <laughs> Got to delete that. Let's see, where is it? Uh. Okay, so copy out the repo name. Paste that here. Search. Okay, so once you find the repo, you can hit connect. And so this will automatically connect Roku to that GitHub repo. Um, so every time you push to GitHub, it will automatically deploy this thing. Now there's a couple other configuration things that we have to do. Okay, so going back to the notes. Um, click the button, enable automatic deploys. Okay, so I think there's a button. Oh, here it is. Okay, so click this. Enable automatic deploys. So I, I guess by default it doesn't do that. All right, so we need... Okay. So now go to your repo and you want to create this file called a proc file. And... This is, uh, so it's just capital P proc file. And you're going to paste in this line right here. And so this is just some configuration, just telling um, like the default folder that's being served by Laravel. We didn't have to do this with like a plain PHP app because we just navigated directly to files like index.php or genres.php. But given now, it's there's like no index.php. Well, the index.php is actually contained within this public directory, and that's what's being served up. And then it kind of behind the scenes is all like you know talks to that web file and then the controllers and all that. So that's essentially what this is doing. You say, hey, Heroku, this is where it kind of is, configuring it for Laravel. Okay, now the last thing we have to do is this .env file, this contains all of these environment variables, and by default, Laravel ignores this, right? So it's, it's an entry inside the git ignore. So this is not committed in GitHub, and we can actually verify this by, if I go to this repo, you can see that there is no .env file. There's the .env.example file, but there's no .env file. And the reason for that is this file most often times has sensitive information like database passwords and all that. Right now, it's all kind of the defaults and the SQLite database doesn't have like a username or a password, so there's nothing really sensitive here, so it's fine. But um, by default, it's ignored. So we need to create these variables on Heroku because Laravel does use this when we're uh, running locally. So if we go back to Heroku, if you go to the settings tab, there's this reveal config vars, and it's kind of annoying, but you just have to enter them each one by one. But luckily, I kind of fin figured out like the minimum number that you had to do, and it's just these. So um, you can watch me copy them. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can do this. Uh, I wish they had like a thing where I could just like dump the entire file up, but they don't. Okay, so the uh, app environment, there's like a, I think there's, there's development and production. I'm turning it on for development because uh, when we push it up to Roku, it's nice just to see errors, at least just because this is like a school homework, so it's fine. But if this were a real app, you'd probably want this to be production, with which would um, turn off like errors so that people don't see actual PHP errors and stuff. 
So we'll add this one. Let me close this. Um, the app key. So I'll paste that. And then whatever yours is, so I'm just going to copy mine out. So I'll add that. So app debug is true. Okay, so app log level is the bug. I'm guessing this is um, just giving more information for uh, for the logging. So if you want to, you'd probably want this, you know, just for homework, just to help you debug if it's not working on Heroku. And then lastly, DB connection is SQLite. Let's see, did I get that right? No, sorry. It's QLite. This is like one of those things we'll just have to do once, and this is why we're not going to install Laravel for every single class, just because it's, you know, doing these things gets a little annoying. Um, okay, so at least the Heroku side's all set up. Now if we go back to our repo, I need to commit up that uh, proc file, and by me pushing this up, hopefully it will trigger GitHub, and then which will then trigger Heroku to kind of deploy this thing. So I'm going to say git add all git commit as Heroku proc file and I'll say git push origin master okay so this pushed up to my github All right so we see this here 12 seconds ago cool and if we go to the deploy tab on Heroku let's see maybe it's activity okay activity build in progress so I kind of saw this, saw the change. Now it's rebuilding. I don't have to think about um, like pushing to Heroku separately. It's all kind of ready to go. So it's a very uh, nice and automated. OK, so the build succeeded. Now let's see if this works. So I'll say open app. Something went wrong. <laughs> um, Let me see if I miss something. Database. Right. Oh, <laughs> dang. Hope you had it. Let's see. Okay, so database, database.sqlite. I did the composer thing. Heroku automatic deploys. Proc Oh, app database does not exist. App database. Oh, did I not add it? Oh, wait, I think I know what it is. It's a... Uh... Oh. <laughs> okay, um, inside the database folder, there's a also another git ignore that says ignore SQLite files. Uh, we'll just delete this. All right, let's see. Yeah, let's just delete that, or, or just delete that line, or you can delete the file. Okay, so now if I do git uh, git status, cool. Okay, so now it found it. Git add all. Um, git commit as database SQLite. Oops. 
Okay, so git push origin master. Okay, so if we click on activity again, it'll probably get triggered. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so refresh. Yay, there it goes. Okay, so let's try some of these things. I'll search for... Cool, okay, so it looks like it's working. So, I mean, a little annoying, but uh, relatively quick, at least when you compare it to like FTP and stuff. So we'll have this one installation that we'll use going forward for pretty much most of the classes. Um, we'll also do the same thing. We'll have to redo it like when we get to the node stuff because we'll do it again for node, but um, it's pretty much the uh, similar process. Um, cool. Okay, so let's look at the assignment. So it's basically rebuild the same thing that you just did, but in Laravel. So you'll kind of get like, you already know how the app is supposed to work. You're just going to like take this, you know, the Laravel concepts and use those to kind of build it inside this like MVC framework. Um, so I added a couple of things like uh, use blade templating, use the query builder, which is that DB class in Laravel. Uh, you should use controller. Um, and then when you push it up, push it up to a repo called ITP 405 Laravel. So you'll have like two. You'll have one on Heroku just for the class stuff and then one on, um, let's see, actually, does that make sense? You know what, let me change this. Actually, well, You can actually just use the same project that you've been using unless you want to do it yourself, um, like go through the same steps. But if you want to just use the ITB Tunes one, that's cool because it's all using the same database anyways and it's like the same type of app. So um, if you want, go ahead and use it and I'll just change this later. Uh, otherwise, yeah, if you want to try and do it yourself and, and call it this, that's cool too. So it is a good experience like going through it, but you know, it adds a little bit of headache too. <laughs> so up to you. Any questions? Cool. All right. Um, see you guys next week. And yeah, stick around if you need help setting things up or got something wasn't working.